Today, we begin the fourth in the series of hearings conducted by the Joint Fiscal Committees of the Legislatures regarding the Governor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2016-2017. The hearings are conducted pursuant to Article 7, Section 3 of the Constitution, and Article 2, Section 31, and 32A of the Legislative Law. Today, the Assembly Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee will hear testimony concerning the budget proposal for elementary and secondary education. I will now introduce the members from the Assembly and Senator Young, the Chair of the Senate Finance Committee, will introduce members from her Senate. We've been joined by Assemblyman Jeff Aubrey, Assemblyman Harry Bronson, Assemblyman Steve Ost, Assemblyman Anthony Berzinski, uh, Assemblyman Michael Kosak, Assemblywoman Diana Richardson, Assemblyman Walter Mosley, Assemblywoman Woman Sally Mayer, Assemblyman Deborah Glick, and Assemblywoman Rodenzi Bichetti. <laughs> And we have Carmen Arroyo and Assemblyman Oaks to give us the Thank you. We've been uh, joined by Assemblyman Ra, Assemblyman McDonough, Assemblyman Crouch, Assemblyman Graff, and Assemblywoman Malia Takas. Thank you, Assemblyman. Good morning, everyone. And um, I'd like to, first of all, welcome the commissioner and all the legislators to have a healthy discussion today about a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of every legislator in the state of New York, and that's education and our children's future. I'd like to introduce my colleagues who are here today. First, we are joined by Senator Liz Kruger, who is ranking member on the Senate Finance Committee. We're also joined by Senator Carl Mar Marcelino, who is the uh, chair of the Education Committee, and also Senator John Bonasek, and also Senator um, Roxanne Perso. Thank you. Before I introduce the first witness, I would like to remind all of the witnesses testifying today to keep your statement within your allotted time and limit so that everyone can afford their opportunity to speak. And I speak this letters, these words for the people on this dais <coughs> and in front of us. I would like not to repeat yesterday. Uh, first to testify is Mary Ellen Aliyah, Commissioner of the New York State Education Department. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairwoman Young and Nolan, uh, Chairman Marcelino and Farrell, and other members of the Senate and Assembly, thank you. Um, I am Mary Ellen Ely, and I'm the Commissioner of Education in New York State. I'm joined by Senior Deputy Commissioner Joan Ebert and Executive, Executive Deputy Commissioner Beth Berlin. You have my full testimony before you. I will speak to a few slides and then will be happy to address your questions. Because this is my first opportunity to address you during a budget hearing, I want to begin by introducing myself to those of you who don't know me. As some of you know, coming to New York to serve as Education commis Commissioner was a homecoming of sorts. I began my career in education as a social studies teacher in the Sweet Home School District outside of Buffalo in 1970, where I was a member of NYSEC. I taught for 19 years before moving on to various administrative positions, but I still consider myself a teacher at heart. So if you've done the math, you'll know that I've been in education for over 45 years. In that time, I've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. Today, I'll, I will lay out a road map in four key areas for a budget that invests in New York students and educators. My first priority in this budget is to ensure that our schools are fairly funded through a return of concentrated investments in foundation aid and a full restoration of the gap elimination adjustment. By most measures, the economic crisis has lifted and there's no longer a need for the GEA. In December, the Regents gave final approval to a state, 
state aid proposal calling for a $2.4 billion increase in state aid designed to address many of the challenges we face and to provide new opportunities for our teachers and students' success. On slides two through four, you will see the highlights of the Regents State Aid Proposal, which recommends a $2.1 billion increase in operating aid, which includes $434 million for a complete GEA restoration, which has unfairly penalized many districts, as well as a $1.3 billion increase in foundation aid, with an additional $345 million in strategic investments to ensure that school districts can improve teaching and learning. Among these investments, which are highlighted in further detail on slides five through nine, we recommend $125 million this year for expanded access to full-day pre-kindergarten, $75 million to support struggling schools in the initial stages of the receivership program, $75 million to support the unique needs of English language learners, $45 million to support high-quality professional development for our educators, as recommended by the governor's recent task force report, and $25 million for startup programs that support family and community engagement. In addition to those current year investments, the regents recommend new reimbursements in next year's budget, highlighted on slides 10 and 11, supporting the creation of career and technical education pathways and digital learning. My second priority is the creation of a truly universal pre-kindergarten program detailed on slides 12 and 13. We know that pre-kindergarten makes a difference in preparing students for school, and studies indicate that children who participate in high-quality preschool programs are 25% less likely to drop out of school, 40% less likely to become a teen parent, 50% less likely to be placed in special education, 60% more likely to attend some college, and 70% less likely to be arrested for a violent crime. The Regents recommend that you build off the historic investments in pre-K by committing $125 million in this budget to work towards a truly universal program, particularly for upstate where investments have been limited and for high-need students who have the greatest demonstrated need for these early learning opportunities. While we are encouraged by efforts to expand pre-K to three-year-olds, we should first ensure that all four-year-olds have a high-quality full-day pre-K seat before we continue to expand the scope of the program. I also urge you to reject further fragmentation of pre-K. We currently have six different pre-K programs operating under six different sets of requirements, and this budget process proposes a new seventh pre-K program. It's time to make a robust investment and align the existing state-funded pre-K programs into one streamlined system that is allocational, not competitive. Our districts and our kids should not have to compete against each other for programs we know will help all of them succeed. It's also critical that pre-K remain with the state education department, not a new board, to ensure programmatic continuity and to put the children in these settings in a better position to achieve a successful and streamlined transition to their early grades education. My third priority for this budget, as you can see on slides 14 and 15, is to fight for high-quality, rigorous professional development opportunities for teachers and principals. Let me be clear, teachers, teachers are the key to improving outcomes for students. And the key to helping teachers make a difference for their students is to provide them with professional development opportunities that support continuous improvement. As you know, 
I was a member of the Governor's Common Core Task Force um, with uh, Chairman Nolan and also Chair Chairman Marcelino. In our December report, one of our key recommendations was to provide new professional development opportunities. Unfortunately, this recommendation was not funded in the proposed budget. I urge you to provide $45 million to support professional development for our educators so that the value we place in teachers is reflected in our state's budget. The last priority I'd like to discuss with you is the issue of pathways to graduation on slides 16 through 20. We know that students learn in different ways and our education system should reflect that diversity rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. The Regents took a historic first step last year by approving the 4 plus 1 multiple pathways model, which allows all students to substitute one of their Social Studies Regents exams with approved alternatives. As I have traveled the state, I have consistently heard about the need to expand pathway options for all students <coughs> but with particular attention to options that would benefit students with disabilities and English language learners. Last month, the Regents discussed how we expand pathway options while retaining rigorous standards. We, dis we discussed expansion of the appeals process and the use of project-based assessments. I want to let you and our education stakeholders know that we have heard you and I'll be working with the Regents and the field to develop both short-term and long-term options to better ensure that all students have the opportunity to better demonstrate what they know, particularly students with unique learning needs. Our pathway efforts will require new resources at the state and local level and we look forward to working with you to make this a reality. Finally, in response to President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative, Regent Young led a work group to study how we can improve outcomes for boys and young men of color who are persistently left behind by our education system. Among the work group recommendations were several initiatives, like expansion of the very successful PTEC model and other exemplary programs, to expand opportunities designed to capture and retain these students' interest in their education and keep them in school so that they graduate and can move on to post-secondary education or careers that pay a living wage. Together we can eliminate New York's achievement gaps and make our education system more just and equitable. Before I take your questions, I'd like to close by thanking you for the opportunity to discuss my priorities with you. The testimony I've submitted to you addresses important department budget requests on slides 21 to 32 that I did not cover, but that, would be, that I would be pleased to discuss with you. I know you have a challenging task ahead of you in the next few weeks to develop a spending plan for the entire state. While there's been a significant focus on economic development and infrastructure in the proposed budget, I'd like to ask you to keep in mind that the investments you make in those areas will mean less for our businesses and our state's future if we fail to make major investments in our workforce pipeline. This is not just me telling you that. Studies indicate, I was with the um, business group here in Albany yesterday, talked to them. They are very anxious to be partners with educational institutions around the state. They have a clear understanding and appreciation for the importance of highly trained workforce in supporting a strong economy. Multiple studies, like the ones described on slide 33, tell us that we have a skills crisis, not a jobs crisis. A 200, or 2014 study identified 44,000 job openings for middle skill workers, such as computer programmers. Yet over 2.6 million New Yorkers aged 25 and older did not have the credentials to fill those jobs. Together, we can build a workforce pipeline that is the envy of other states. Please invest in our student success in this budget. Let's together 
send the message to students, teachers, principals, school leaders, parents, and all New Yorkers that our children and our schools are the most important infrastructure of our state. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Commissioner. I'd like to note that we've been joined by Senator John DeFrancisco. Uh, first to testify, Chairwoman Nolan. Thank you, Mr. Farrell, my colleagues. First, Commissioner, I cannot thank you enough for a concise presentation, and a, a, I appreciate your giving us the slides but not taking us through them one by one and uh, knowing that uh, people will look at the testimony. I, I just want to say very publicly what a pleasure it's been to work with you in the short time that you've served as our Commissioner, and uh, you know your direct and forthright approach, I know, is going to make a difference in the leadership at State Ed and in the, hopefully in the support that we can give you here in the legislature, and I want to really endorse the priorities that you put forward today and the, uh, the, hopefully that we can deliver on some of the things that you've asked for. I do uh, want to ask just briefly, though, if you could elaborate a little bit more about community schools. One of the things I struggle with as chair of this committee is education jargon. So we have renewal schools, community schools, struggling schools. We did put 75 million and the governor has certainly initiated another 100 million this year. Even I am not quite clear as to what the differences are or the overlap. So maybe you can just take us through that. And I know a lot of our colleagues have asked me uh, to ask you uh, what's happened with the 75 million from last year. Is it out the door? Is it in the schools? We had a hearing, as you know, on this topic just a few weeks after you started, and we appreciated then your willingness to talk about it, but perhaps you can update everyone as to what's happening in that issue area. Yes, um, thank you. So um, the funding that came from you last year, and thank you very much, we appreciate that. I know that the schools across the state, uh, those schools that received the funding who were persistently struggling, those schools have received their funding and they've moved forward and many of them um, in, in areas that you represent are making substantial differences and changes in what's occurring in those schools to support kids. Um, and relative to the community school um, concept, in fact, a number of the schools that received funding in this past um, round this, this year were in fact implementing community schools. As you're well aware, the law calls for an involvement of the community in the development of what will be the key factors that bring change. A community school offers wraparound services for parents and for children and for siblings of children in the schools to support them. Um, it, can, it can range from anything from um, medical services to psychological services to emotional supports. Um, to after school activities, to expansion of the programming from the regular day into the after school time, and also provide um, opportunities that the children in these communities might not have. So some of those things that um, would be important for children, the expansion of art programs, the expansion of um, athletic programs after school. So a community school really supports the community that that school is located in, and the children and the families that attend it. As I said, many of the schools that we have that are, were persistently struggling or struggling have already begun those efforts. And um, we're seeing that, that the communities are, are responding to them. And I would say that um, New York, um, in my experience, is very committed to have community support that is not-for-profits and actual community groups within um, the, our cities and our towns supporting those community schools as they develop. So it's a great idea. We have several that have already started and we need to work through how that legislation, if we move forward with additional funding, how we would identify that um, that would go to schools. Thank you. I know there's a lot of other people who want to ask, and I do get the chance to talk to you pretty regularly. So I just want to say again, I wish you well. It was terrific testimony, and we're looking forward to a good discussion today. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Don't Commit faint, Denny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking all my time. No, I'm happy to let Senator Marcelino and other okay. colleagues ask questions today. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to introduce Senator Carl Marcelino. I'd like to introduce <laughs> Assemblywoman <laughs> Fahey, Assemblywoman Lifton, Assemblywoman Asana Simon and Assemblyman Bill Colton. Also, we've been joined by uh, Assemblyman Rhea. I must say you have a full house here today, Commissioner, full house. Well, thank you for joining us. Okay, Senator Marcelino. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Good morning, Commissioner. And again, good morning. Thank you for coming. And we hope we will not duplicate yesterday's <laughs> debacle, if you will. <laughs> I thought you all wanted to stay for the day and talk about this important topic. <laughs> uh, only, only if you will bring a lunch. <laughs> I might work, but otherwise, no. I was pleased to hear that you consider yourself a teacher at heart. Um, still to this day, and I, I also consider myself a teacher. I taught 20 years, as you well know. Uh, at Global Cleveland High School, one way away. Uh, Kathy Nolan had the misfortune of being one of my students at the time. Uh, it's hard to believe, isn't it, but true. <laughs> very hard to believe. As my colleague over here said, that's what's happened. I did. But, uh, we, uh, we remain friends to this day. Uh, a chart was released uh, by the department that mm -hmm. talks about the testing program or the required tests uh, for the Common Core. Mm -hmm. uh, the recommendation, one of the recommendations from the task force, number 13, was to reduce the number of days and shorten the duration for standard aligned with state standardized tests. Right. Uh, in this chart has been picked up by a number Senator, of Senator, your mic's not on. This chart, ooh. <laughs> you really don't want me to start all over again, do you? No, no. Never okay. no. Use your teacher voice, call. <laughs> I'll do it. I thought I was, but that's okay. <laughs> this chart uh, it pro proposes to look at, and it appears when you look at it, uh, to require the same number of testing days as has been held in the past, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem to reduce testing. So some of the people in the opt-out movement are saying, see, Marcelino, when you say give them a chance to do right by us, uh, the first thing they do is they go back and do the same old thing all over again. They're really not trustworthy. Uh, can you explain uh, this chart and how it's going to be operated and how it complies, if it does, with the recommendations of the task force? Well, you gave me a great opportunity to say publicly I am a trustworthy person. When I say that we're going to do something, we're going to do it. And let me run down the differences in the testing program for this spring so that you clearly understand it. Uh, that was part of the discussion in the task force, as you remember, I'm sure Senator Marcelino and, and Chairwoman um, Nolan. So uh, let me talk about that new testing program. We have hired a new, com uh, a new company who is doing our testing with us. Uh, Questar is, uh, has been very receptive to the demands that we've made of including teachers across the board in our testing program. Um, and so, as, you, as was pointed out in the beginning of my testimony, I am from New York. Like many of you probably, I have a Regents Diploma. I then taught in New York for 17 years and I participated and reviewed assessments in New York as a teacher here. So one of the things that we have to do, that we are doing for this spring's assessment, is having teachers be involved in reviewing the questions, the match to the standards, and the, um, and the particular uh, reading passages that are part of that. Every one of the assessments in grades three through eight, language arts and mathematics, has been shortened. Following that, next year, if possible, we will shorten the days. But I want to make it clear to you that if you are going to have enough questions on the test that re require students to be able to read and respond and understand, and that we know from their responses that they understand, you will be required to have a certain number of questions. Some of the, um, some of the time limits particularly for our younger children in grades three, four, and five, I think we can shorten down in days. We're working very diligently to do that. But understand that this spring there will be major changes. That does not include, and I've never said it included, going to a two-day test as opposed to a three-day test. And I want to point out something to you. If you are in third grade, is it better to have a longer period of time or to have it chunked out to three days for 60 minutes each day? And those are the kinds of questions you have to ask. So those decisions should be made by, um, by practitioners, by experts. And one of the things that I um, am very pleased to say that we've already adjusted for this spring is that if a student is productively working, we have 
distributed information and will make it very clear to districts that students who are productively working can continue the assessment. I heard from parents across this state and from teachers that part of the stresses that we had on our kids was that they were timed, and particularly younger children. So if they are working productively, then they will be able to continue the assessment and move as in a setting where they can read, comprehend, and respond to the questions that correspond. So we are making major changes. I've just reviewed them. I have, in every setting that I've been in over the last seven months in my tenure, I've talked about the changes that we are making for this spring's assessment. And those are major changes, Senator Marcelino, as I'm sure you're aware. When you talk about the time test, are you dealing with uh, special education or, or students with special needs only, or is that for everybody? That's for everyone. So any, any youngster, no matter what, if they are working productively and the, the time limit bell goes off, they will be given time by the proctors to finish their test uh, and, and do the best they can? Yes. Okay, that, that, that should clear up some of that. We're still using, you talk about hiring another company, uh, Questar, but this Questar year... Questar is a new, new company. Yeah, but they don't come in until next year. This year, you're yeah. still working with the prior company, Pearson, by contract. Am I wrong? It's a transition time. Um, Pearson is not running the test. Questar is running the test for us. But we are using the questions that were developed prior to that with input from New York State teachers this year prior to the development of the test. I'm sure you know that much of the complaining and much of the problem uh, posed by a lot of parents and teachers was that the, t the questions in some cases were just incomprehensible and the required steps and answers were just ridiculous uh, to perform. So what you're telling me, I just want to be clear on this. If I'm wrong, correct me, please. Uh, but what you're saying to the, to the public is that uh, the questions have been reviewed so that they will meet appropriate standards and that they will be age appropriate for the youngsters who are taking the test? Yes, and, and so let me point out one thing. As you're aware as a teacher, you know that when you give an assessment, if every child could answer every question, then you aren't able to really determine how well students are doing at the high level and what students are struggling some. And so every question that you walk in, every child will not feel like this is the easiest question to answer. However, within the test and the structure of the test, there are multiple levels of difficulty, and we are responding to what is an appropriate response for um, assessing a student's abilities. I appreciate that. I just have one more question, if I might. You talked about uh, universal pre-K. Yes. Um, as being important. You're expanding that to third grade, to third, to three-year-olds. Um, there are schools throughout the state that don't have full-day kindergarten. Um, do we have any idea what the number is, by the way, statewide? There are nine districts across the state that do not have kindergarten. There are approximately, um, and I'm saying approximately very purposefully, approximately 20 to 30 that do not have full-day kindergarten. Um, so that is an issue that we are looking at um, with the regents. But um, the point is, before you in the budget is a proposal to expand um, pre-K. I read to you the key elements of what occurs when a student has been participating in a quality pre-K program. We should have all children in New York in a quality pre-K program, and we should target four-year-olds first, so there is equity and opportunity across the entire state. And certainly it could benefit three-year-olds as well. But I think it's important for us to, to say that there's consistency across the state and that your zip code does not determine where it is and how, what age your child can go to pre-K. So my suggestion, my strong recommendation is that we go for a four-year-old pre-K program statewide for every one of our students. And you're right, we do have to address the issue of those districts that do not have either a kindergarten at all or a full-day kindergarten. I appreciate that, and I just want to thank you. You testified before the Education Committee uh, and, and of the Senate, and it was a well-received testimony. I personally uh, respect your efforts, and, and, and I found working with you and speaking with you that you are, to my mind, truthful and forthright, 
and you say what you mean and mean what you say. So um, thank you very much for your testimony. And thank you for giving me a chance. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Assemblyman Kuzik. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th thank you, Commissioner. It's great to see you again. I, I want to thank you once again uh, for coming out to Staten Island uh, a couple of weeks ago with Chancellor Farina to uh, St. <clears throat> St. Charles School uh, to look at the, uh, the pre-K program that's going on there. I I'm just going to follow up. I know my colleagues uh, have many questions, so I'm, I'm going to be uh, as quick as I can and go off the, the track a little bit on, on the uh, Common Core uh, questions. But I wanted to ask about the non-public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke a little bit about it uh, at St. Charles. Uh, and uh, you're aware of the challenges that non-public schools have when it comes to uh, meeting the requirements of state and federal regulations and uh, uh, the laws that, that bind them uh, federally and state. And I know there's a movement and there have been suggestions in reestablishing the uh, Office of the Non-Public Schools. Uh, is there um, a request on your part for funding for reestablishing that? Yes, and um, in fact, I have that on um, this, one of the slides that we presented to you. Um, and, uh, we'll find it very quickly. Um, I, I, would, I would concur with you that we have um, we have intersections with non-public schools in many ways um, through funding that comes in that they are able to access through programs that we have um, related to attendance procedures, etc. And so, um, so I believe that it is to the benefit of certainly the non-public schools and the state education department that we have a designated office. Um, I want to point out to you that we, have, we are down approximately 40% in the staffing in, in the State Ed Department. And um, on, about 40% down, right, thank you. And, and if, you, um, if you move to slide 23, it does a comparison there of the State Ed Department's percentage of funding that comes from um, the budget, the proposed budget, and um, our general fund in the state to State Ed with a couple other departments compared there. I just want to point out, unfortunately, um, Several years ago, that office, because of the constraints that we had in staffing, that office was disbanded. Um, I would agree and support that. And if you'll see on page um, nine of the slides, um, we are in support that, that the reestablishment of that office to serve non-public schools and to better connect what is occurring with all of education in the state of New York with the non-public schools and support them as they receive the funding just to really um, help students across the state. Well, th thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I know that there are uh, many members who have been working on that. I know that uh, Chairwoman uh, Nolan has spearheaded uh, that in our house and working on that issue. I also just want to ask a question. Uh, I've, I've asked this question of many people, but uh, uh, the issue of the heroin epidemic and the opioid epidemic uh, reaches many of our young people uh, in, in throughout the state. And I know in New York City uh, there, there's a movement in a lot of the local schools to start educating uh, some of our students uh, on, on the epidemic and the uh, downfalls of, of uh, heroin and prescription drugs. Is there anything in the planning stages or anything happening on the state level uh, that, that we can start pushing for uh, in our districts? Yes. Um, we are we're very concerned, have had um, discussions with the staff and with the regents about this very issue. And um, we've partnered with other agencies, particularly the Department of Health, to talk about how we might work together to make sure that we get factual information out to our schools. Um, one of the ideas that I have is that we would provide training across our um, school systems and across the state so that um, teachers are aware of what resources are available and that this should be provided as a, um, as a part of their education in a health program, health setting, or in a science program 
that it really is a critical thing for us. It's something that we clearly, to support students, that ultimately we want to be successful. It's one of those uh, areas that really we need to help.